my name is Carolyn Mackler. I am the author of several novels for young people and the new adult novel, The Wife Out. Welcome to Open Learning by AJU. For those new to the American Jewish University, AJU Open Learning aims to build community and bring Jewish wisdom to the world in the hopes of helping people better understand themselves and the world around them. We are here right now for an exclusive interview with the author of You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah, which I, I think is an amazing title. Whether it's your first time joining us or your 20th, I am so glad you are here today for this interview with the author of what has been widely called the Bat Mitzvah Book of the Century. So we are joined by Amanda Stern, who wrote this novel under the pseudonym Fiona Rosenblum. Amanda as Fiona is the author of You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah, and here's the cover, great cover. And um, it's just been made into the hit Netflix movie of the same name. And she is also the author of a novel, a sequel called We Are So Crashing Your Bar Mitzvah. As Amanda Stern, she's written the memoir Little Panic, a novel called The Long Haul, and the weekly newsletter how to Live, which has a shocking 18,000 subscribers. Amanda is joining us now from Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. Thank you for Hi that great there. Time. How's Love the weather it. over there across the East River? I'm over here in Manhattan, way far away from you. It's hot. It's, it's hot. hot. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's, it's summer in October. Um, but I love it. You know, it's, it's, uh, I, it, summer could keep going on other than, you know, all the horrible stuff about global warming. Right. Um, so let's dive right into questions. Um, you are so not invited to my bat mitzvah originally came out in 2005. I'm gonna hold it up. So let's see. There we go. Um, but you recently reissued an updated version to coincide with the Netflix movie. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the book for those who haven't read it yet? Oh, yes, sure. So um, the book is about uh, two best friends, Stacy and Lydia, and um, their idea that having the best bat mitzvah is sort of signals a, a good life, the start of, you know, a life of ease and, you know, fabulousness. And um they really are trying to, to make the best of, you know, their event and they get into a fight over a boy and Stacy uninvites Lydia to her bat mitzvah and a lot of things happen involving rabbis and sisters and, um, and boys and, uh, and, you know, things happen in the book that are a little bit different than in the movie. So people will have to just read and watch both but yeah it's uh, okay um so what inspired you to write this novel so there actually was no inspiration it's always <laughs> okay. a surprise to people um it's also a surprise to people that I didn't have a bat mitzvah um which we can get into later but um I was uh one night in 2003 I was hosting an event and um an I have to interrupt you and say that one night in 2003 that story could go so many different directions right <laughs> we'll have to do a different webinar for <laughs> called one night in 2003 yeah, exactly. okay so one um, night in 2003 you were hosting an event hosting an event and there was an editor in the audience and afterwards she came up to me and she said you're so funny um do you have any interest in writing children's books and I had just come out with my first novel that month and um you know it's an it's an adult a novel for adults and um and it was dark and I said no I have no interest at all I'm like you know really dedicated to this path of writing literary fiction for grown-ups and she um sort of pursued me and in, in like a, a a flattering way not in a creepy way and um she told me that they were looking to to hire someone she worked for a book packager and they're looking to hire someone to write about bat mitzvahs and so i just thought well i'll write a sample chapter 
maybe this will get her off my back and right. um and to just try it out and I loved it it was so much fun so I said yes sure I'll do it and um so I, I wasn't inspired by anything in particular to do it but once I was in um I drew on a lot of my own uh middle school dramas and fights and I did there was uh, a, a huge fight that that I had when I was in middle school it didn't involve a boy um but I drew on that experience a lot yeah um, so I uh you know actually this is I'm jumping ahead to a, a question later and also someone asked in the I'm trying not to read the Q&A, but here they come. Someone asked for your name. And I'm just going to clarify that her name name, like if you went for coffee with her, you would call her Amanda Stern, or maybe you just call her Amanda. But if you um, went to buy the book, the middle grade, she writes under the pseudonym Fiona Rosenblum. And we will figure out more about that later. So I'm going to jump to my question, which is um, kind of ties into what you just said, which is that I read in the recent uh, New Yorker talk of the town about you, and you just said that you did not have a bat mitzvah. So congratulations on that New Yorker thing. Um, you were uh, just famous to me when I saw that. Um, so, but it said you did not have a bat mitzvah. Um, can you tell us um, a little bit more about that? Like, uh, did you grow up going to bar and bat mitzvahs? Did you, uh, were you not part of that world at all? So I grew up, um, you know, I'm I'm 100% Jewish on ev uh, going all the way back. There's like no break in the chain. And <laughs> you would think that, you know, I would be, you know, that I would have been raised with, some sort of religion or, you know, um, Judaism in some capacity, but I really just wasn't. Um, there was no emphasis on spirituality or religion of any sort. Um, and, you know, we were just sort of free range in all the ways. And um, my, as I reached middle school, a lot of my friends were having bar and bat mitzvahs and I don't recall feeling jealous or like I wanted it. Um, I, in fact, I think I probably wasn't jealous because I had so much anxiety and I yeah. couldn't have imagined actually pulling that off. Um, so why are people looking at you at an age when, I mean, I, I know that, I mean, we talked a little bit about anxiety when we were chatting last week and we can come back to that, but I was at an age where I did not want people looking at me at 12. I mean, I'm right? st I still don't want people looking at me. <laughs> They're looking at you right now and you oh, look amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you kind of didn't grow up going to bar and bat mitzvahs. No, I did. I went to them, but um, but no one in my own family had them. Right. Um, we didn't celebrate Hanukkah. Um, so when my parents were growing up, I'm fourth generation native New Yorker. And when they were growing up in New York, there was um, sort of this, you know, in the in the sort of um, bracket of social circle they were in there was uh, a de-emphasis on their on being Jewish and so my mom and my dad were both raised with this sort of like oh we gotta you know don't make a big deal out of it don't show that we're Jewish let's have Christmas and so it you know it sort of it wasn't about religion at all it was just sort of about act like acclimating or or you know adjusting to the climate at large. And so by the time it got to our generation and we saw that people around us who were Jewish were doing Jewish things. So it was a little bit confusing why we were having Christmas. Um, but, you know, it's just, I think old habits die hard maybe, but uh, so that's, you know, that's the way. So how did you, so, so you went to some, um, but how did you research for this um for the for the bar mitzvah for the bat mitzvah book of the century how did you <laughs> research to make it feel so spot on well I'm really glad that it feels so spot on um I I don't know that it is because I didn't have one so I'm happy about that but what I did was um at that time I was really good friends with this woman named Kim and she grew up um with you know an observant family and 
her father wasn't a rabbi, but basically like could have been. And she had in her childhood home, a, like a box filled with all of her bat mitzvah practice material and all of her bat mitzvah notes. And I thought, I got to get to that box. So um, she and I flew to Scottsdale, Arizona, where she grew up, or or maybe not, I can't remember where she grew up, but where the box was, and um, and where her parents lived. And I went and I studied the box, and I talked to her father, and I asked them lots of questions, and I went to a few bar and bat mitzvahs, um, I read about it, but I felt truly like what would make it the most authentic would be to center it on what the book is really about, which is about friendship mm -hmm. and, um, you know, about a rift between these two best friends around an event that has, you know, they've sort of taken out of context because they're so young um, and, you know, and given it a premise that, you know, it's it's more about the theme and the, you know, the presence and the party than it is about growth. Um, so I really focused on the friendship element of it. And that for that, I just had to revisit my interior life and um, which I am want to do far too often. Um, yeah, I think most writers are. Um, so you I saw that you made changes for this reissued version. Um, what changes did you make for this update between the original uh, novel and this new one? So, um, okay, I'm going to be completely honest. I um, There was no plan for me to revise, but I picked up the old book and I started to read it. And I on page two, I thought, wow, we have, as, as a society, we have changed so yeah. much. And by the time I got to page 11, I had counted like at least 30, no, that's too high, like 11 instances of like, mm, this is a little problematic today. Like it just, there was, you know, take anything and that I, that you, from 2003, when I wrote it and try and, you know, make it work today and it won't probably, um, technology included. So I, you know, I just emailed the, the publisher and the editor and I said, this has to be updated. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let you republish it as is. And so um, they let me, and I, I got it. I had so much fun, of I, course. so much fun. Like the little brother, Arthur, I got renewed love for and I changed his character a little bit and I just I really it's such a weirdly joyous thing to write for and for young people and as in the voice of a young person it it just it's so um enriching in this weird odd way that writing for adults isn't it's enriching in different ways, but not in this same way, so. Well, that actually ties into my next question perfectly, because you've got, in, in this novel, you have a seventh grade girl um, talking to God. You've got Jewish identity. Um, mm -hmm. So to me, that evokes, um, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, um, the, the iconic middle school novel by Judy Bloom. Um, did you, so these are, two-part question did you grow up reading Judy Bloom, and or what so, novels did you grow up reading I grew up I grew up both I grew up reading Judy Bloom and other novels but I was a pretty pretty diehard mm -hmm. uh, Judy Bloomite and um I still am but I just yeah she like so many I mean it's almost a cliche at this point because so many women say like she raised me she right. taught me um and you know I just there were things I had oh oh when I went to when I I went to see the movie yeah. and with my best friend from middle school and as we're watching it I was like oh my god that's where I got that 
that I, I realized that so much of how I think and what I think about and what I know is from her. Yeah. And so I just, yes, I loved her. I also loved, um, this is younger, but I really loved Ramona and Beezus. Oh, um, of course, yes. <laughs> a huge Ramona fan. And, um, and um, at, you know, I loved books like Tuck Everlasting and, um, uh, God, what else? Uh, did Natalie Babbitt write that? Uh, yes. Yeah. No, no, yes. I won't look I it up right that. now, but I believe she, yes. <laughs> yes. I so, love, love that book. Um, and that book taught me about writing and how when you're writing about one thing, you're really actually writing about another. Um, so, yeah. Very um, cool. Yeah. But, oh, just to go back to your question. Um, so, yes, the in the book, in my book, um, I do a, a nod, an overt nod to Judy Bloom in the form of Stacy talking to God mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just like a buddy, her buddy um, and we're well, calling in some favors, but it's a, it's like a very overt nod mm -hmm. uh, as a, like, you know, thank you for, you know, giving us so much. Um, I love you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so interesting. Um, how much you know I think most writers really did grow up as readers you know I don't think I've ever heard a writer who didn't grow up obsessed with books um so I can we talk about the movie I, I, know mean, the I don't is. know I don't know but I'm gonna just say like let's yes Okay, so with just some background because of the writer's strike, uh, I know you have not been allowed to talk publicly about the movie in solidarity, of course, um, but uh, You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah was made into a Netflix movie that was trending at number one this summer. Is that right? Yes, congratulations. It is starring Adam Sandler and his entire family. Uh, tell us how the movie came to be. So. That I know a little bit less about, honestly, because of the situation in which the book was um, presented to me, I, it was through a book packager, it wasn't through a traditional publisher. So when it's through a traditional publisher, the writer has more um, rights and, you know, I, I don't own the rights to the book um, because it went through a book packager. So they own the rights to the book. Um, and so they sort of did a lot of upfront work before I knew about anything. Um, and then I just was told and I thought, well, this is a incredible day that feels surreal. And, you know, it just, everything had sort of already happened. And then I was told about it and, um, yeah, I just, it, it, it it totally blew me away and um, and it felt very surreal, but then I went to set and I spent five days on set and um, maybe perhaps, I spent a year in Europe traveling with the Cirque du Soleil and that one week I spent on set might have been the best week of my life. Okay. So I, 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 I wanna ask you a million questions about Cirque du Soleil, um, I, but back to the one week of set that was equal to one year of Cirque du Soleil, do you have any anecdotes from the set that you can share with us? I do. Um, <laughs> I really, like, I really hope I'm allowed to be talking about the movie now since the strike for the writers is over and if I'm you know not, if for some reason you are not comfortable we can just say there was a movie there's a book um we can move on would you rather do that um let's talk about it for another minute maybe and then but I do want to share an anecdote because it's really sweet um, and we want to hear it <laughs> and you know um yeah so when I got to set um I first people I met were the two were two boys who were in the movie and um, they were so like awed by the fact that they were meeting the author of a book, the book. And I was like, you're, I'm sorry, you're in an Adam Sandler movie. Like, are you, mm -hmm. you, do you understand? <laughs> but this is not the impressed part. Um, so it was just very sweet and cute to see that. And then the next person I met was Adam and um, he, 
chatted, you know, was chatting up with me and asking me where I grew up. And I told him McDougal Street in the village. And um, he introduced me to his kids and all that. And then like five minutes later, I hear McDougal, McDougal. And I turn around and it's Adam. And he's like, come here, you got to see this shot, McDougal. And it just was the, I, I don't know, it was just like something about it was just so, he like gave me a nickname. I don't care if it was because he forgot my name. I really don't. He <laughs> just, like, um, it just so he kept on calling me McDougal and oh. I loved it so much. So um, uh, we can, um, that, so first of all, like you were a buddy. It sounds like you were in. <laughs> we've talked on the phone and we text. That's really cool. That's really cool. Okay. So um, now that we know that you're, Second pseudonym, second pseudonym is very hard to say, um, is McDougal. Um, let's go back to your first pseudonym, um, Fiona Rosenblum. How did you come to write this novel under that pseudonym? So um, I, did, well, first I just, I'll tell you how I came up with the name and why I decided to write under a pseudonym. Um, I decided to write under a pseudonym because at that time in the early aughts as a literary as a you know literary fiction writer there wasn't a lot of room to experiment and try writing different genres without being pigeonholed so I thought well if I I you know if I want to be known as uh, you know a literary fiction writer I maybe should protect that and mm -hmm. create write this under a pseudonym and then I can just continue that um, writing for middle grade, writing middle grade fiction under a pseudonym and those two avenues will be separate and I won't be pigeonholed and blah, blah, blah. So things have changed, but that was where we were at then. And so I thought, well, what should I call my, like, what is my name going to be? So uh, my mom, her, her maiden name is Rosenblum. And so I thought, well, that's a no brainer. So it's obviously going to be Rosenblum. And I have always thought, I've always felt like in the core of my soul that I was misnamed and that I just, Amanda is not, it doesn't suit me. I'm like, I've grown into it more and more, but it just hasn't, it didn't suit me for so long. And so I said to my mom, um, if you, if you had to rename me, I said, I think you miss you misnamed me. Well, if you had to do it again, what would you what would you name me? And um, Josh, sorry. And she um, didn't even there was no hesitation at all. Um, and she just said Fiona. Okay. And I was like, uh, OK, didn't guess you've thought about that, too, huh? Um, <laughs> so, I don't have someone who's misnamed. That is so interesting. I'll let, yeah. when, when we meet in person, I'll have to evaluate whether I think you look like an Amanda or a Fiona, I'll let you know. Uh, <laughs> um, so under the name, your real name, your, your wrong name, um, <laughs> Amanda Stern, um, I mentioned in the intro that um, you wrote a memoir called Little Panic, Dispatches from an Anxious Life. And um, when we chatted last week, you actually said this quote that I loved. You said, your anxiety and your face are the two most Jewish things about you. Um, do you feel comfortable expanding on that? Yeah, and I stand by that. I think I will stand by, by that for the rest of my life. Okay, um, tell us more. And I mean, what, I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, what I, I, I you know, I have anxiety. I feel like anxiety belongs to the Jews. And uh -huh. we it naturally, we've just, you know, um, and, um, you know, it's, it's also that in my family, my, um, my siblings, my two older siblings have bright red hair and are very pale and, um, are very fair. Mm -hmm. And, um, and my little sister is very conventionally beautiful and I, am the the most Jewish looking person in the family. So there's been like, you know, some little digs at me from within the family about how, you know, um, whenever I'm dressed up, they're like going to your bar mitzvah. Um, they, whatever. It's, 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 it's yeah, totally, I know, I know. you're um, going up, yes. yeah. Um, so, um, so I just always sort of, <laughs> I've developed this sort of consciousness 
where it, I didn't have before that I looked Jewish. And I never really, it never occurred to me that one could look Jewish, but, you know, as it's been pointed out to me over my entire life, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm just insanely Jewish looking fine. Like <laughs> that's my, this is my face and um, I'm Jewish. I'm happy about both. Well, the face I could, I would like, you know, some changes, but, um, but the Judaism I'm in. I mean, um, I think it's fascinating that you didn't ask anxiety to go away. Um, and uh, it this actually isn't one of my official questions, but I imagine anxiety uh, sometimes can fuel you as a writer because you imagine all the what ifs. Do you find yeah. that? Well, yes, um, but because I've I've had anxiety since I was nonverbal, you know, mm -hmm. I've had I had panic attacks from a very, very young age. It's. It, I've never experienced life without it. And so I can't, I can't wish it away. I wouldn't want to wish it away. It's, it's, right. uh, you know, I've had so much to overcome. And I think having to face your fears and go towards the things that scare you are what grow a person. And, you know, it, it's what make, what it, I have had, I've always had a purpose. And that purpose has always been be free from oh. this. Yeah. Be free from this. And the only way to do it is to just go towards it. Other people have a, you know, uh, uh, other, they have other purposes, you know, it's a change the world of, if you, you know, uh, disband this militia or well, whatever it is. I can't even think of things at the moment, but um, <laughs> I don't know why. Disband the militia. Um, I and, think saving the world is a great one, but yes. Uh, but, <laughs> and disbanding uh, the militia. Okay, go for it. Keep going. <laughs> and, um, you know, and mine has always been um, conquer your fears so that you can then live the life that you really want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so anxiety has given me a purpose and it's just to be more free. I love that. I love that. I wrote that. I just jotted it on my notepad, conquering fears. Um, so we are almost uh, about to get to the Q&A. Um, and I have so many more questions that um, I'll just have to ask you when we meet. Um, okay. But can we finish up with what are you working on now? Or can you share a little bit about some projects you're doing? Yes. I mean, we only have 15 minutes, but um, <laughs> uh, so, okay. So I do have this weekly newsletter. Um, called How to Live. And I, it takes a lot, like a long time to write those pieces. I don't just write it in a day. So I'm constantly working on that. I write about psychology and philosophy. And um, it's all about how to basically what I've been doing my whole life, like how do you free yourself? Um, and uh, so I'm working on that. I'm working on a novel for adults. Um, and I'm working on on a nonfiction book proposal to turn the newsletter into a coffee table book. Um, I'm working on a digital workshop for uh, parents with anxious children. And, um, but I think that anyone who has anxiety can take it. Um, what else am I working on? And, you know, I have little ideas here and there. Oh, oh, no, yes, TV show. Um, I'm working on a TV show. Um, I, um, it's not made I'm working on a pitch and it's for the my other children's books frankly Franny um which I I, I think that Franny deserves to have a tv show yeah. you sound very busy um I just uh I think good luck with all of that that's really exciting um I hope it all works out um wonderfully yeah. Um, so we are going to uh, jump over to the Q&A, and I am looking at them right now, and I'm just going to go in chronological order. Um, hopefully we can get through a bunch. Um, so we have Barbara, and she asked if you are interested in doing an adult um, bat mitzvah now. Uh, she wrote bas mitzvah. I'm sure that... Um, I guess that terminology might be for an adult. Um, she did lots of women in New York City and elsewhere enroll in uh, adult bas mitzvah classes. 
Yes. Um, a, a lot of people have asked me that. I really don't have any interest in doing that. What I do have interest in, though, is um, something a little bit different, which is um, a naming ceremony. I'm part of this little Jewish meditation group. Um, and the rabbi, I, I was very sick for 10 months this past year. Um, and I'm still sort of sick where we don't really know what's going on, but I'm fine. Don't worry. I'm not, you know, terminal or anything. Um, and um, the rabbis at Beloved, this community that I belong to, um, offered to do a naming ceremony with me um, where they give me a Hebrew name because I've never had one. And that I really want. I really want like a naming ceremony. And then maybe after that, I might be interested. But that comes first. Okay. Can, can you tell us your Hebrew name? Um, I can't. I'm not allowed to yet. Oh, you haven't done it yet. Okay, got it. They, the, I know it, but I'm not allowed to share it until after the ceremony. Okay. Um, now, um, another person asked, "What was the inspiration for the over-the-top clergy characters?" Oh, I think that might I be a reference to the movie, right? I had. I didn't. Um, I didn't write the movie and I didn't have any input into it. So I don't know, but I will tell you that I ran into her. Rabbi Rebecca is her name. Um, I ran into her in my neighborhood where she lives. Okay. Lives in okay. My After, it's Sarah Sherman, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, she's amazing. Amazing. She's so wonderful. Yes. Well, she lives in my neighborhood, which was such a nice surprise because I really loved her. Um, and then I'm kind of scrolling through the questions because a lot of them you've already answered. Um, someone asked, um, they'd love to hear how writing for a book packager compares to placing a book with a traditional publisher. And I think you've answered that a lot, but if you want to just give a little, a brief answer. Um, I would say that when you write with a traditional publisher, you feel a little bit more, um, proprietary of your book you feel a little bit more like you're more attached to it if you if you work with a book packager a smart thing to do is what I learned early is to constantly remember this is you know this is someone this is for someone else this is for someone else this is um I don't get proprietary about it don't get so overly invested which is a very hard thing to do um but th that's just sort of the difference I think where you feel a little bit more like you're you are the book mm -hmm. when you write with a traditional publisher and you are alongside the book mm -hmm. when you are with a um book packager okay Okay. Um, thank you for explaining, clarifying that. Um, now, this is one I've been wanting to ask since you mentioned it and someone did ask it. Thank you. Um, they asked, what was your connection to Cirque du Soleil? Oh, so um, yes, I, um, an old boyfriend of mine was cast in it and uh, as a, one of the lead performers and um, he was allowed to take me. So I went and I spent over a year in Europe going from place to place to place, traveling with the Cirque du Soleil, making friends in different cities. And um, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. It was just the best um, year that ever. Sounds like, that sounds like it could be a novel or a memoir. I think I, I would read both. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird. I don't have interest in writing that, but maybe when I'm 80. <laughs> right. When you need material and. Um... Yes. I guess we're generating material all the time, though, aren't we? Um, what uh, someone asked, uh, David asked, did your Jewish background contribute to your sense of humor? And I love that question because it just implies that you are funny and you are funny. So tell us your thoughts on that. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Um, I feel like my sense of humor, I developed it early as a way to, I mean, maybe yes, because I developed it because of my panic attacks and as a way to sort of throw attention away from what was happening inside my body, even though no one can see it, you don't, you, you think they can. Uh, 
because you're a child and you just don't know. So I, I really developed uh, a very early a sense of humor around um, getting, um, making other people laugh so that the attention wasn't directed towards me in ways that made me uncomfortable. Um, and I, but I developed it so that I usually, I make fun of myself. I don't use it to hurt other people. Um, a lot of people think that that is humor, but that's not humor. Um, you know, when you're using it at the expense of someone else's feelings, I use it at, my, at the expense of my feelings. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. That's a real, it's an interesting question. I'm actually going to think about it. Okay. So I would love to ask hear me again in three weeks. You got it. No, we'll meet back. Um, so another person, uh, this is actually just a comment, but I'll give it to you because it's really sweet, Patty. Um, she said a lot of people have found this movie a bit over the top. Oh, well. Um, but she is a bar and bat mitzvah planner in Dallas, and the movie cracked her up because it is so accurate. It may be embarrassing, but it's true. That's so um, I think that's lovely. Thank you, Patty. Um, and now um, Lori asked, which character do you connect the most with? And is there a different character you relate with um, more in the movie versus the book? Oh, that's a good question. You know, there are aspects of me and everyone, including the brother um, in the book. And um, this, is a, it's this is a weird, a little bit of a weird response because the older sister in the movie wasn't in the book, but mm -hmm. I kind of related to her. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, just sort of her deadpan humor, which I don't have, but I was like, I get you. We would have been friends in high school. Mm -hmm. um, but I do feel, um, you know, the movie I want to say, it's really theirs. I feel like the movie is theirs. They they made the movie. My book was source material. Um, mm -hmm. And... So I, I don't see myself so much in those characters in the movie, but I love the movie and I love the characters. But in the book, I just, I obviously relate much more to um, Lydia and Stacy and mm -hmm. Arthur mm -hmm. um, and, um, and the parents a little bit. You know, you're like in a dream, when you dream, you're everyone. It's mm -hmm. the same as your work, you know? You're oh, everyone. interesting. I like that. Um, I, so I'd love to hear, so you have a sequel. Um, can you give us a title of that and tell us um, people how they can find it? I do not remember what that's about. Um, I wrote that one in 2005 and I haven't refreshed my memory of it, but I believe it's, you know, the girls crashing um, the boys bar mitzvah. Um, but I can, honestly, I'm going to like, I'm not going to try and fake it I don't remember and this is what happens with books and I'm sure you can attest to this, that you write a book it takes like a year and a half for it to come out and then when it comes out you go on tour and people are asking you questions you're like wait was that in the book you, you know you just forget um, I know yeah I know so, sometimes I have to uh reread it you know right before I go on tour um because it's like uh yeah it, it's at that point also I find I'm working on a new book and my head's there yes. uh, Totally. So um, someone asked, speaking of writing, um, do you have any tips or advice for an aspiring writer of middle grade books? Um, this person says they have so many ideas and it's something they've always wanted to do, but they're just not sure how to begin. Yes, but I'm going to answer this with you. Okay? okay. Because you also have tips, I'm sure. Okay. Um, all right. So um, because you have two middle grade authors, you can't, you know, um, right. I would say um, you have all these ideas. You don't know what to do. I would say um, pick the one that is in your body. Pick mm -hmm. the pick the idea that means something to you mm -hmm. and that matters and not the one that is in your head, not the one that's in your head and getting like awards and you know like the ones you're congratulating yourself about in your head um mm -hmm. because that's just those are stories you're telling yourself you don't know what's going to happen what matters is you're spending a lot of time with something you you want to spend time with the right things so do what's in in your body mm -hmm. that's fine. okay i love that and i would say um 
just to write every day, even if it's sitting down for a half hour and just working on voices. Um, you don't even need to write what will be published. You can just say like, I'm gonna write about this character for a page. I'm gonna write about the mom. I'm gonna write some dialogue, but just be in the um, the the habit of writing. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. So we are, uh, we're actually out of time. So oh, no, I want to, uh, I want to thank you, Amanda slash Fiona slash McDougal. Um, <laughs> for a fascinating conversation about you are so not invited to my bat mitzvah. Um, I love what you had to say about writing and friendship and anxiety and um, just all the different ways someone can be Jewish. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And I hope to see all of you again soon. And thank you so much again, Amanda. It's just been lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was great. I love talking to you. I love the questions. And to um, American Jewish University, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so you're awesome. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.